Hello Fiber friends! In this video, I am going to ply the alpaca that I have been working hard to spin for the last couple months. If you haven't seen the how I spin the alpaca or card the alpaca and working backwards wash the alpaca, you might want to watch them in a different order, but they will be linked down below. This is a video in a series where I have broken down each of the steps along the way. So you can watch and maybe learn and hopefully be a little entertained. Today in this video, I will show you two techniques that I use to create a two ply yarn. It will be a lovely, fluffy, consistently spun yarn that is plied together to create a two stranded final yarn. The first way that I ply yarn is by using two bobbins and I take the end of each of the two bobbins and I spin them together. I was very fortunate that my Lazy Kate came with my wheel, but if you don't happen to have one and you'd like to try this technique, there are some really innovative ways that you can use to hold your bobbins and make it easier for them to spin without, uh, sorry, to ply without getting tangled up. My favorite hack, if you will, that I've seen is people use a dowel rod and they stick the, um, or even a hanger wire and they stick their bobbins onto the hanger wire or dowel rod and they thread it through two holes on the end of a shoe box or even better because everybody probably has one, a laundry basket. It works really well and it's a perfectly acceptable way to hold your bobbins. Basically, you want them to be able to turn freely but not be bouncing around to tangle up on each other. So let's head over to the wheel and I'll show you exactly how I ply my yarn to get a lovely balanced two ply finished yarn. I placed the Lazy Kate down by my feet and I bring up, I bring up the end from each bobbin and this is what will go together to be plied. I am using my first edition Ashford Elizabeth. It is set up with the bulky flyer and bulky bobbin because two of the smaller bobbins together is going to make a larger bobbin and this is great to set it up this way for plying. I wanted to mention a couple things about this wheel or any similar wheel. If you have a whorl, I like to put it on the largest groove. This is the drive band and it's going on the largest groove. That means that even if I treadle quickly, it's going to turn this slower. I want it to be slow because I want the control. The other thing is if you have an option on which way to turn your bobbin and you're using a scotch tension, this is scotch tension right here, this band that goes over the bobbin, slows it down, it gives it drag and that's what allows the yarn to be um, taken up onto it. I turn it so that the large side of the bobbin is what is receiving the drag. It's receiving the scotch tension band. The reason I do that is because the larger the surface area to create the drag, the more control I have over the friction, over the tension. And that allows me to make very delicate adjustments to the uptake and it gives me more control while I plot. Those are a couple tips that should be very helpful. To get started, I'm going to pull the leader string over the first hook and into the orifice. I'm using my orifice hook that my son made me out of a paper clip. So clever, very simple. So I'm gonna tuck that out of the way. And next, I need to make sure that the tension is where I want it to be. When I spun this yarn, I had the wheel, the drive wheel, the big wheel, turning clockwise. Now to ply it, I need to go the opposite direction, which means I'm going to turn it counterclockwise. I want the tension to have a stronger take up for plying than I did for spinning. The yarn does not need as much twist to get the ply set just right, so I'm going to increase the tension a little bit which will make the draw in stronger. That's about where I want it to be. 
So I will start by taking the two yarns. They've already started to ply together because they are energized with twist. I'm going to just stick them in the end of this leader loop and fold it back on itself and let the twist run up. And that's really all I need to have to secure that and get going. I will keep these separated as I go and let it twist and draw in. Once I've gone just a little ways, I'm going to check that the ply is coming together in a way that balances out the twist. I want these two pieces of yarn to counteract their own twist to the point that they become balanced. If I treadle too fast and put too much twist into the yarn, it will over twist and then it will have energy the wrong direction. The way that I can check this and see how I'm doing is to pull it back out from the bobbin, let it dangle, and fold it over. If it has energy, it will be creating these curly cues like this yarn is before it gets drawn into the wheel and plied. If it's creating a balanced yarn, when I hold it this way, it won't twist up on itself. It will just dangle, and that's what it's doing right here. So it looks like, to start with, I have a pretty good rhythm going. I'm going to continue at this pace. I feed the two yarns together. I keep my treadle nice and steady, and I have the tension set so it's drawing in exactly at the pace I want it. I can also control a little of the tension by pinching it, letting some twist in, pinch, twist, pinch, twist. That's another way to control how much is going into the yarn. If I've done my job right and I have spun these at a consistent twist throughout their length, then once I establish a rhythm of plying, it's going to go fairly quickly and it's going to be uniform all the way through the whole skein. So let's pull this out again and just double check there it is, okay. This is the most frequent thing to happen when plying. How do we know if it has too much twist or if it has too little twist and how do we fix it? One of the ways you can tell that your yarn is underplied is that it has a sort of loose look to it. You can see some of these little bumps are separating and that's because the energy is working against it. If I've given the ply exactly what it needs, when it hangs down, it won't twist up on itself at all. Or it might have a little energy to it, but it's not gonna go crazy and wind around itself a whole lot. If it's hanging just like that, nice and loose with a loop, but it's not catching it back on itself, I know that I have a nicely balanced yarn. That's my goal. If I'm treadling too fast before allowing the yarn to go onto the bobbin, I will have an over-twisted yarn, and that's what I'm creating right here. One of the ways I can tell this is over-twisted by looking at it is that it's very tight and ropey looking. So here, there's still a smidge of twist left in it. That much can get balanced out very easily at the end when the yarn is being finished. However, I do not recommend applying it with a known over or under twist and then attempting to fix that in the last stages by hanging it with a weight. That will not actually fix the over twist. It returns back to its original state as soon as the yarn is wet again, which could be very frustrating if you put over twisted yarn into a project thinking it was okay because you hung it with a weight and then you go to block your project and the whole thing starts to wrinkle and scrunch up because your yarn has too much energy in it. That can be a very frustrating situation. As I go, I'm going to frequently stop, let the yarn dangle, and see that I am getting exactly the right amount of twist into my two plies. Like I said, I don't want too much energy and I don't want too little energy. It takes one moment to stop and check and see how I'm doing. It takes an entire respin to fix a major issue that I let creep in there. So I recommend just taking your time, stopping as you need to, and checking that you are on your way.
If you have finished your project and you only have one bobbin left, but you wanted to do a two-ply yarn, that's okay. You can create a two-ply yarn from a single bobbin by creating a center pull ball. It is very simple to do that using a simple ball winder. This is a large ball winder, so it will give me a large center pull ball and it has plenty of room to fit all of that fiber on there. I've used this for um, large skeins before and it, it does great. When the ball has been wound onto the ball winder, it is ready to go and ply. I like to set it in something so that it doesn't bounce around on the floor while I'm plying because it's not on a bobbin, I can't put it on the Lazy Kate. So I'm going to set it in this basket and what I wanna make sure I do is keep track of both of the ends. So this is the end from the piece on the outside that wrapped all the way around. This, if you pull it straight off of the top, is the end from the center, there it is. And I'm gonna just uh, keep these two together because that's where the plying will start. And if I lose one of those, I won't have a place to start the ply. Um, it has energy, so I usually just sort of pinch off a distance like that, let it twist on itself. It's ready to attach to the leader when I get it to the wheel. So then I just carefully slide it straight up and off. And I will just continue finding the rhythm between how much to let onto the bobbin and how much twist to put into the two plies. And once I find that rhythm where they're coming together without bunching up, let's see. All right, so that's a little too much twist that I'm putting in it. There we go, that's a nice balanced ply. So I will give it just a smidge less twist than I was, and it should be nice and balanced. And there it is. That's a nice balance. It's not catching up on itself. This is what's left so far of the center pull ball. It looks like a little cake of ramen noodles. And I have this strand still coming out from the inside and this strand coming off of the outer edge. What I've done as I've been spinning to keep it from getting tangled up is to let this feed out from the center and let this come off unraveling the other side. When, they, when it switches around and they're both coming off this side, they tend to twist around each other before I get the twist up into the wheel and it can cause some tangles. So I just wanted to show for the very, um, for the very end of this how I'm, how I'm spinning this off of here. So I'm pulling the one from around the outer edge with my left hand and I'm guiding the inner part out with my right hand with my thumb and index finger and just letting them feed in. And in just a moment, just wanna be gentle and make sure that it doesn't catch and snarl because if it turns into a knot at this point, I would just be very disappointed. But here it is. Can you see this is all that's left? And so plying from a center pull ball, it basically folds the yarn over on itself. So when you get to the end like this, there is nothing wasted, nothing left over. It comes right off the end, just like that. Catch me in the next video and I'll show you how I skein the yarn off of the bobbins, wash it, and write up some tags to give all of the information about it so when you pull it from the stash you know exactly what kind of yarn it is and what projects it would work for. I'll show you all of that in the next video. See you then.